Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about marine sediments. Now before you turn off the channel, just be aware, marine sediments aren't as boring as the, as the words or the, the phrase uh, sounds. It's actually really interesting stuff. Um, as we've been building the earth and then building the ocean basins, we're now going to start lining the basins with the sediments that define what we think of as beaches or, or uh, uh, maybe coastlines and, and things that we see out in the deep ocean. So before we can fill the oceans with water, which will be the next lecture, um, we need to go ahead and define what it is that makes up the very bottom of the ocean, what makes up the coasts, the beaches, and why are they distributed the way that they are. So that's what today's lecture is going to be about. Okay? It's going to be about marine sediments, but basically it's going to be about what we think of as a beach or the coastline as we go forward. Later on we'll have another lecture completely on coastlines that will uh, describe why coastlines have the different shapes they do for coastlines with uh, cliffs or beaches or, or, or whatever. So, but anyways, this is a, a kind of a quick uh, introduction as we're going forward. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this. Let's jump in. So, the, one of the reasons why we care about marine sediments is, first off, remember the oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface. Okay, um, but it also includes a lot of life forms. It also covers a lot of Earth's history right there on the surface of the Earth in the oceans, right? Because it's such a large amount of the surface area. So it provides a lot of clues to Earth history. For example, uh, marine or, uh, organism distribution, right? Where do certain types of animals live? Uh, that's actually determined by the sediments or, or discoverable through the sediments. The ocean floor movements, what's going on on the ocean floor, right? Again, more evidence for plate tectonics will be seen in this lecture. Um, ocean circulation patterns, climate change is a major factor, and of course global extinction events. All of these can be read from the sediments. This is a picture of a uh, machine that has actually taken a sediment core from off the seafloor. Basically, they drive a pipe into the ground, and as they pull it back up, you can see that the mud is still stuck inside the pipe. And those sediments can be analyzed to be able to learn about these different events. And down here, we see some really cool bed forms that are forming uh, on a coast. Um, we're going to go into, at some point, uh, some details about these things, but not right yet. All right. So, what is a marine sediment? Well, they're little bits of, of stuff, right? Junk that's debris, that, that's basically earth debris all along the coastline. And it could be thought of as uh, being classified in, a different, in several different ways. We usually go about classifying it based upon its origin, okay? Um, and sometimes by its texture. So, texture is important, that's just the size and shape of the particles. But the origins are important, right? The worn rocks, right? When, when rocks get broken down by wave action or by weather, um, possibly living organisms, uh, maybe little bits of algae or, or uh, something living in the rocks or raining stuff out of the, uh, out of the water column. Uh, minerals dissolved in water. A lot of minerals on the Earth's surface are dissolved in rain, and that rain winds up in rivers that wind up dumping into the ocean. And of course, outer space. Rocks are falling into, onto the Earth all the time. Hey, statistically speaking, 71% of them should be landing in the ocean. Okay? Sediments lithify into sedimentary rock, right? So the soft stuff, sands, wind up becoming sedimentary rock, what we would call a sandstone. Um, and of course, these are usually, in, in terms of oceanography, these are usually classified by origin. So lithogenous um, sediments are derived from land. In other words, lithos meaning rock. Uh, rock generated, uh, derived from land. Biogenous, this is life generated, derived from organisms. Hydrogenous or orthogenic, um, these are derived from water. In other words, these are things that form directly in the water column. And cosmogenous, which is derived from outer space. We're going to be covering all of these classifications this lecture. Okay, this is a, a, a neat little chart that kind of shows the classification of marine sediments, where they come from, and where you can find these things typically. For example, here we see the lithogenous, the biogenous, the hydrogenous, and of course the cosmogenous uh, rocks right here. Um, kind of a typical one would be rock fragments, quartz sand, quartz silt, and clay. Quartz being that really hard mineral that is uh, very common on the continents. Uh, compose, uh, chemical formula is uh, silicon dioxide. Um, the sources of these tend to be rivers, glaciers, turbidity currents, 
And where we find them, there's the continental shelf, continental shelf at high latitudes, and of course, continental slope and rise. We just learned about these over the last couple of lectures. Okay, um, so it turns out that the lithogenous sediment and the biogenous sediments, as we and you can t pause the, the the slide or pause the show and and, and read the slide yourself. Um, a lot of this stuff can be um, used to figure out the type of depositional environment um, in which these things happen. For example, biogenous sediments form on continental shelves and beaches. Um, it, provided they have the microscopic shell producing organisms, right? And it happens to be warm water. So if we're looking uh, for coral reefs, where would we expect to find those coral reefs? Shallow, low latitude regions, for example, in the tropics. Um, and we can continue right on down. Yeah, like this one down here, everybody's interested in cosmogenous stuff, right? Space dust, iron nickel spherules, tectites, and silica glass. Uh, usually it's considered space dust. And in very small proportions, mixed with all types of sediment in an all marine environment. So it's occasionally you'll find a little tectite, a little piece of space dust stuck inside of your sediment. Pretty cool stuff. But eventually you get one of these things, a big meteor that will slam in. And you might actually get meteorite fragments distributed throughout uh, a local area. And sometimes we see these impacts on the bottom of the ocean as well. <clears throat> all right. So Paleoceanography and marine sediments. What is paleoceanography? Paleoceanography is a study of how the ocean, atmosphere, and land interactions have produced changes in ocean chemistry, circulation, biology, and climate. Marine sediments provide clues to the past or to these past changes. And so what we see here are two paleoceanographers. They're looking right here at a sediment core, just like the one that was pulled out of the uh, uh, ocean earlier on, the, the, I showed you the image earlier on. Um, they're looking at the sediment core and seeing what they can find in it about past clues in the oceans, right? And we'll talk about how we know what is going on going forward and we'll kind of let this all, all this information kind of flow out and it'll be pretty nice by the time you get to the end of it, you'll realize how we know what we know and how we know when certain things have happened. So let's just jump into lithogenous sediments. These are the most commonly understood and experienced ones, uh, unless you happen to live in certain tropical islands where there's reefs and things like this, in which case you get biogenous sediments. But the lithogenous sediments are the most common ones that we think of. Um, these are eroded rock fragments from land. Uh, if you're in, in California, they tend to be this orange color because there's a lot of mineral, a lot of quartz and feldspar. Those are two common minerals. Um, if you happen to be in Florida, it tends to be white because it's biogenous. If you happen to be in Hawaii, it's usually black because the uh, island chain there um, has a lot of uh, basalt, which is a black rock that then gets broken up. In other words, it's derived from what rocks exist in that area. It's also called terrigenous, meaning land generated. And they reflect the composition of rock from which they're derived, which is what I just stated. Uh, produced by weathering, breaking of rocks into smaller pieces, right? You just take a big boulder of whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's basalt or if it's granite. You start breaking it up, right? And you break it up through either you run water over it or you, have a, you throw it into a river or it falls down a landslide uh, or it winds up in wave action on the beach. So the small particles get eroded and transported and eventually they get carried to the ocean through streams, wind, um, and if you happen to be up in a cold region, glaciers, and gravity, gravity through the form of landslides. Um, the greatest quantity happens to be around the continental margins, around the continents themselves. You have these big, thick piles of lithogenous sediments. Later on in the lecture, we'll show a map showing you where those big, thick sediments are. And here we see a classic example of it, right? This nice sand beach right here. All right, so this image here is... Uh, from out of the textbook I typically use in class. And um, this image here shows the, oh, lost my stylus. There it is. All right, here we see a river that's distributing sediment into the oceans and dumping it here locally. Uh, here we see a big, this is military uh, vehicles in the Middle East, a big sandstorm coming through and moving sand uh, by wind. Uh, here's a glacier down here. This is a big, thick, um, flowing ice unit that has a lot of broken rock. As it moves, it picks up rock and it breaks it 
And of course, occasionally we just see a failure of a slope, right? Gravity just taking this pile of sediment, which used to probably be right here, and just bringing it down onto what is probably a beach, okay? And then that material then gets worked up by the beach through storms or whatever, and gets distributed as beach sand. Lithogenous sediments reflect composition of rock from which they are derived. So in other words, if it's derived from a granite, it's going to have a lot of the same minerals in it that granite has. Coarser sediments tend to be closer to the shore. Finer sediments are farther than, uh, from the shore. And many minerals are basically quartz. So this is sand right here. Um, sand, this is quartz here, quartz here. There's occasionally another mineral here. This little mineral in here is probably feldspar. But these are almost all quartz grains all throughout here. There's another mineral over here, which I can't quite identify what that is. But anyway, you get the idea, this is mostly quartz, that white glassy mineral that's in there. It's mostly quartz. And that's the main composition of beach sand. Okay. Now you might be asking, why the, clo the coarser sediments closer to shore? Simply because bigger stuff is harder to transport, right? So it can't get as far away. Whereas finer sediments can be transported quite long distances. Um, as a matter of fact, they can be uh, deposited way out into the open ocean. As long as they're small enough that they can float into the water uh, a very long distance, right? So you wind up getting a really interesting process of sorting the coarse stuff from the fine stuff uh, in these uh, marine basins. Okay. So here we see um, lithogenous sediment being sorted in just that way from wind transport or by wind transport. This is the coast of Africa right here. Um, there's the Canary Islands, which are located out, I believe, right out here. They're kind of covered by this by this sandstorm. And you can see here, this is from the Sahara Desert. This sand is being pushed out over the open ocean, and most of it's not going to actually make it very far. It'll actually get deposited onto the bottom of the ocean. Okay. Here we see the prevailing winds in the area. Uh, this will be something we'll talk about later on in class, where these prevailing winds come from. But off of the coast of Africa, these winds are pushing the sediments right here off the coast and depositing it. Here off of North America, uh, there's deposition of quartz uh, grains being pushed up into the northern Atlantic. Um, we see the same thing happening in the Pacific. This is material that's coming in from China. And some of this does, in fact, make it from China to the western part of the United States. So uh, lithogenous quartz um, can be deposited very long distances by wind. That's the point of this. Okay, so grain size is important, right? Small stuff can get transported far, coarse stuff not so far. It stays pretty close to wherever it, uh, wherever it got deposited into the ocean. In other words, the waves can't, tra can't transport it a long distance. So one of the most important uh, sediment properties is grain size. It's proportional to energy of transportation and deposition. We're going to talk about that um, uh, a little bit later on when we get into beaches, um, about how that proportionality works. Um, and it's classified by the Wentworth scale of grain size. So if you happen to have this range in millimeters, uh, you know, this is how big it is. Clay is really small, uh, 1 496th, uh, 1 4096th to 1 256th, that's uh, of a millimeter. That is so small that you can't even feel the difference. It is so tiny. Clay is one of those things you can put in your hand and, and smear around. It is so tiny and it feels sticky. Um, the next size up is silt. Silt is right here. And this is still something that you can't see. It's still invisible, but it's very fine-grained. Um, that's silt. The first thing that we can actually see with the naked eye is sand. If you can see sand, or if you can see the individual grains, but even though they're small, they're sand, and then they go to the granules, the pebbles, the cobbles, all the way up to boulders in terms of their size. Okay, Everything from sand up to boulder is considered a gravel. In other words, something vis visible, right? You can actually see it. And the kind of environment in which you would find it in would be from low energy to high energy. So in order to get a boulder to move, you need very high energy. But to move clay, eh, not so much. You need almost no energy at all. It can actually float around in the water column for quite some time. Okay. So we just kind of implied this. Texture indicates environmental energy, high energy. So in other words, uh, which means strong wave action. You get larger particles moving around. Low energy smaller particles. This is the reason why if you go swimming in a lake where there's no waves, 
it tends to be that the, the sediments you get lining that lake are really fine, kind of muddy material. Whereas if you go to a, uh, the ocean, it's usually lined by beaches. In other words, sands that are, that are, that are more of a high energy type of environment. So the larger particles as a consequence tends to be closer to shore, at least in the case of the oceans. Uh, sorting is an important thing to bring up too. Um, they me it's the measure of grain size uniformity, right? So here we see some sorting down here, very well sorted. Notice all the grains are about the same size. It's still well sorted, moderately sorted, poorly sorted, and very poorly sorted. In other words, here we have very small stuff right alongside very large uh, grains. So if it's well sorted, it's all the same particle size. If it's poorly sorted, okay, it's all mixed together. So it indicates the selectivity of the transportation process. So some rocks, like sandstones, have, a, have this type of texture, whereas other rocks, such as certain uh, turbidity currents, which we'll, we've talked about actually in the past, can be relatively poorly sorted. Whoops, got ahead of myself. All right, so we can then distribute our sediments in two different provinces, right? We've been talking about things that are coarse or are, are nearby, and things that are fine grain tend to be um, deposited further away from the coastline. Well, further away also means deeper, okay? And so that allows us to then classify our oceanic sediments into two different categories, the neuritics and the pelagics. So the neuritics are shallow water deposits, that stuff that's really close by, it's close to land, and is dominantly lithogenous. Not always, right? This, as a matter of fact, here's one that is not lithogenous, there, even though there's a lot of sand in it. Uh, this is mostly shell material. Um, and it's typically deposited quickly, right? This is something that, that forms very fast, maybe in the event of a storm, or maybe a river is depositing things very quickly. In contrast, we have the pelagic zone. This is deeper water deposits out in the open ocean above the abyssal plain. Okay, finer grain sediments, really tiny clays and silts, mainly clays, of course. Um, and it's deposited very slowly over periods of tens, thousands, and even millions of years. And here we see a picture of the sea floor. There's a nice little uh, visitor here that's uh, looking at our camera. But we can see that the grains down here, this is basically a muddy ooze at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, this is deposited very far away, and that those those clay particles are raining slowly out uh, and covering the bottom of the oceans. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and emphasize the neuritic stuff first. So neuritic neuritic lithogenous sediments, you know, main thing that we think about are the beach deposits, and these are mainly wave deposited quartz rich sands. But it's not the only place we get them, right? We also get con continental shelf deposits, things that are pulled out over the continental shelf. And those are relic sediments, uh, things that were maybe deposited right along the beach, but have slowly been pulled out away from the beach and deposited out onto the, onto the shelf. Um, turbidite deposits, we see graded bedding. This means that we find um, uh, various grain sizes with each one of these uh, Turbidites, right? We've actually covered this briefly in the last lecture, but you wind up with these types of sequences where you get a sandstone and it's capped with shales and silts, another sandstone, and then it repeats, and then it repeats, and then it repeats, and then it repeats. And you can see that it's just a constantly repeating uh, series of things. These are turbidite deposits. Uh, glacial deposits, high latitude continental shelf. Uh, in other words, you have to be in a cold area to make that happen. It's currently formed by ice rafting. So in other words, the glaciers will go out and when they get out into the ocean, they'll melt. And any of the rock fragments that happen to get picked up while it was going out to sea will then melt out and fall to the bottom of the ocean. And that's called ice rafting. Pelagic deposits are very different. They're very, very fine grain material, as, uh, as you can see here in this image. For some reason, my stylus keeps going out. There it is, all right. So here you can see this is the, uh, this is actually uh, the famous abyssal clay that's on these people's hands. We'll be talking about that down here. Um, it's really fine grained. It's extremely slick and slippery, okay? So it's fine grain material accumulates slowly on the deep ocean floor. Pelagic lithogenous sediments form from volcanic ash, right? Anything that can go up into the air and fall back down. Uh, Wind-blown dust, 
and fine grained material transported by deep ocean currents. Those are your clays and in some cases your very, very fine grained silts. The abyssal clay is at least 70% clay sized particles from continents. Okay, so that's a lot of material and it tends to be red from oxidized iron, also known as rust. And it's abundant if other sediments are absent. So if you don't have other things that, that are forming in the area, you will, you will get a lot of abyssal clay building up. Okay, but because it, it grows so slowly, um, if there's anything else that happens to be deposited in the area, it winds up kind of disappearing into the background. Okay, because that's such a slow former. Anyway, you get the idea like, of how slick this stuff is. All right, biogenous sediment is, is a, of a totally different type. Um, there's two main kinds that we're going to talk about. Uh, so let's just jump into it. There are two major types, the, the macroscopic, which are visible to the naked eye. Those are shells, bones, and teeth. Um, basically, the, the remains of once living organisms, by the way, biogenous. Um, and the microscopic, which are tiny shells or tests, and biogen, uh, biogenic ooze. We'll see some pictures of this, you know, kind of get an understanding of what we're talking about. It's mainly algae and protozoans that produce these things. The two most common compounds are calcium carbonate, which is what makes up reefs, limestone. It's that white mineral that is uh, really common along a lot of beaches. And the other one is silica. Think of quartz, SiO2, or in this case, SiO2 with some water fused onto it. It forms a type of rock that is called opal, or I'm sorry, a type of mineral that's called an opal. So silica quartz or opaline quartz, okay? But silica is important. So let's talk about the silica ones first. So the main things that produce these silica um, deposits are diatoms and radiolarians. And so diatoms are photosynthetic algae, right? They're plants. And when, as a matter of fact, here's a diatom right here. This is a plant, it's carrying out photosynthesis, but it has a shell around it to protect itself made of uh, silica. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, both of these organisms, which is, this is the radiolarian over here, they're both opaline silica. Okay, with the, in other words, the, the silica with the water added to the molecule. Okay, radiolarians are protozoans. In other words, they eat other things. They're, they're basically an animal form. This is not carrying out photosynthesis. This goes out and eats other things. Okay. And so the tests are the shells of the microscopic organisms. These are not the organisms themselves. These are their shells. The organisms themselves live within the shells. Right. And when these things die, the, the tests, you know, they basically fall to the bottom of the ocean and they pile up. Right. So we get a big pile of this stuff and it creates what we call a silicious ooze. If you were to step into it, your foot would just go squishing right into it. It's very small stuff holds a lot of water. Um, it's kind of a really interesting uh, uh, mixture of water and silica shells. Okay. In comparison, we can get this uh, a bunch of shells made from uh, calcium carbonate, right? Remember the limestone? And the main thing that we want to emphasize are the coccolithophores. Now, they're also called nanoplankton and they're basically photosynthetic algae. They're simple, they're, they're very similar to the diatoms, except they have just different shell composition. This is silica, this is calcium carbonate. Coccoliths, uh, which are individual plate, uh, form individual plates from dead organisms. So they're little tiny portions of, of, of the shell, all built together um, to make a single hard shell. In other words, uh, it's not like a snail that has one shell all wrapped around it. It has a bunch of little tiny shells that it's piled around itself, almost like little shields. Okay, and when they die, they all fall all over the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so rock chalk, rock chalk is just lithified coccolith rich ooze. And so here are the famous um, chalk cliffs at Dover. Um, basically, this is a big pile of dead coccolithophores. Another really cool one are the foraminifera. These are protozoans. These are kind of, they, they go out and they eat other things, kind of like the way the radiolarians do. Uh, they use external food, and this is what their shells look like. And again, you can see there's a large amount of space for water uh, around the shells, and this makes it kind of an oozy type situation to have to step into these things. This is uh, using a microscope magnified many times to get a good idea of what's going on in this type of sediment. 
Okay, so the distribution of biogenous sediment is different, right? Remember with um, lithogenous, it was really how far away from the coastline or away from the source you got. That was the kind of sediment you got. In biogenous sediments, it's dependent upon a couple of other things that we need to keep in mind. One is productivity. This is the number of organisms in surface water above the ocean floor. So in other words, there are some places that radiolarians live very well, and there are some places that radiolarians do not live well. So if you're in an area where they live very well, you can expect to see an accumulation of radiolarians possibly in that area. Now the productivity has got to be balanced by the destruction. So skeletal remains dissolve in seawater at depth. We haven't talked about this in detail yet. We're going to be coming to it very shortly. But essentially what happens is the chemistry of the ocean changes as you go down towards the sea floor. And there's a point at which some of these skeletal remains or these tests begin to dissolve back into the seawater. Remember, these organisms pull the material out of the seawater and it dissolves back in. And the question is, does it happen fast enough that it doesn't make it to the bottom of the ocean? In other words, does it dissolve before it hits there? Okay. And of course, the other issue is dilution. Uh, deposition of other sediments decreases percentage of biogenous sediments. So the more of other things that you get there, the less you're going to see of the biogenous sediment. That's all basically it's saying. All right, so let's describe what we're talking about in the case of, say, a siliceous ooze, right? Where do you get siliceous ooze is forming? Well, it accumulates in areas of high productivity. So here's an area of high productivity here. So you're going to get more tests sinking, okay? Over here, we have an area of relatively few, right? So they, they tend to fall. Most of the silica tests seem to dissolve before hitting the abyssal clay, and so we don't actually see it. But if it's above an area of high productivity, we see a big piling of it right here. And once the silica tests are no longer are, are, are buried, they're no longer dissolved by the ocean. Okay. Now, neuritic deposits are dominated by lithogenous sediment, but they do frequently contain bio, biogenous sediment components within them. Okay. So carbonate deposits, for example, uh, have calcium uh, have, or have something called carbonate, which is CO3. Uh, this is very similar to the molecule that we breathe out, which is CO2. Um, and in fact, in the carbon cycle, they're very closely related. Marine carbonates are primarily limestone, which is calcium carbonate. The calcium is derived from the water. The CO3 is largely derived from the atmosphere. And most limestone, I'm sorry, limestones contain fossil shells, which suggest biogenous origins, right? So this is kind of interesting. Ancient marine carbonates constitute 25% of all sedimentary rocks on Earth. So where, how much productivity have we seen in the past? Well, 25% of marine carbonates constitute 25% of all the sedimentary rocks on Earth. That means there's a lot, of, a lot of activity that's been going on in the oceans for millions and millions of years. Okay, so this is an important finding that we can get a large amount of carbonate, say, say reefs, that will be forming right in the neuritic zone, right nearby, and they're still 25% of all sedimentary rocks. It's, it's, it's a tremendously important rock. So this allows us to bring up, I had kind of mentioned that there was a chemistry difference in the water column as we were going down. Uh, let's bring that up right here. So calcareous ooze is, is usually formed in an area where you get a lot of deposition of calcareous sediments, right? Or, or deposition of calcareous tests. So there's a problem though with the ocean. And it's this thing called the CCD, which is the calcite compensation depth. It's the depth where calcium carbonate readily dissolves. So anything up here at the surface where the calcareous phytoplankton are living, the, you know, they die, these tests start to fall. But once we get down to about four and a half kilometers, that's about three miles below sea level, all of a sudden the chemistry changes in the ocean. So below the calcite, calcite I'm sorry, the calcite uh, compensation depth, the ocean temperature is a lot cooler. It's of higher pressure. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in the water already, and it has a lower pH. It's, in other words, it's acidic. So what happens is it's very easy to dissolve the material that's made up here at the top of the ocean once it falls down here to the bottom, uh, below, three, uh, below three miles. 
So the depth where the calcium carbonate readily dissolves, the rate of supply equals the rate at which the shells dissolve. So warm, shallow oceans is saturated with calcium carbonate. There's everywhere you go, where, wherever the water is nice and warm, there's lots of calcium carbonate. You can form reefs very easily. But in cool water, it's a little different. Cold, deep ocean is undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate. In other words, it can dissolve it. So once we get below that line, things start to dissolve. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we get some really cool, interesting things happening uh, across the seafloor. So scarce calcareous ooze below 5,000 meters, right? Below the five kilometers or the three miles in the modern ocean. Why? Because it's below the CCD. We don't see it being formed. You know, we have, imagine here we see uh, an ocean surface and we see calcite secreting warm water organisms. These are your coccolithophores. They live up here and they're dropping down their tests, right? Here's the CCD. Everything below the CCD is going to dissolve into the ocean. But above it, you can actually pile it up. So as a consequence, from here all the way to here, you can, in fact, deposit chalk or calcium carbonate tests across the top of a mid-ocean ridge, provided it's sticking above the CCD. But below that, it will dissolve. So then you start to see the abyssal clay being deposited over here. Okay. Now what happens if we have had upwelling of cold water in an area? Well, it turns out cold water is really good for the silica uh, secreting organisms. The carbonate ones like warm water, the silica ones like cool water. And you get upwelling of cool water, you wind up getting high pro productivity here, and you get silica ooze falling down onto the seafloor. Now remember, you only get abyssal clay forming in areas where you don't have other sediments also forming. So the silica ooze dominates here, and you wind up with calcium carbonate ooze and a silica ooze on top, right? So it's kind of a neat diagram that explains the distribution of sediments across the mid-ocean ridges and across the ocean, in fact. And so we look at these modern calcium carbonate sediments, and sure enough, we do find that they are concentrated around spreading centers, right? Here's the East Pacific Rise, which is a large spreading center. Here's the mid-ocean, or the mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a large spreading center. And this is where we find greater than 80% by weight limestone. Right? We find calcareous oozes being deposited here, and also in the Indian Ocean. We don't find it out in the middle of the ocean. Out here, we would find something very different. Okay? So wherever we see these divergent boundaries, we see calcareous ooze. Where we don't see divergent boundaries, we don't. All right, so let's now move on to the next type, hydrogenous marine sediments. These are sediments that form right out of the water. And these are minerals that precipitate directly from seawater. Manganese nodules are the most famous. As uh, a matter of fact, this is a seafloor image of them. They're all kind of piled around. They cover large portions of the seafloor. Lots of manganese there. There's also phosphates, carbonates. We've talked about carbonates for a while, the, the biogenous ones. But you also get them forming straight out of the water. Uh, metal sulfides, uh, a lot of lead sulfide and barium sulfide and things like this. Um, small proportion of marine sediments. In other words, it's not the largest portion, but they do exist. And they're distributed in diverse environments. They're all over the world, and it depends on certain conditions of when you get them. And the most famous of these, of course, are the manganese nodules. These are fist-sized lumps, you know, a pretty good-sized fist, of manganese, iron, and other metals. Uh, this is a really good concentration. The Earth has a very good uh, concentration of these things on the sea floor. Uh, they're the very slow accumulation rates. And there are many commercial uses, right? We use manganese and iron and, and copper and all kinds of things all the time. And it's really kind of easy to get at these things. Now, the other thing is we're unsure why they're not buried by seafloor sediments. These things are right there up on the surface. We don't know why they're up there on the surface. Um, it's kind of a mystery. They should be sinking into the ooze, but instead they're sitting on top of it. It's, it's, a, it's a major mystery. These are different uh, nodules here, and here we see one that's been cut in half. Here's another one that's been cut in half up here. You can see that it kind of wraps itself around a central core. It, it's, a, it's a really interesting um, question as to how they form and why they stay up on the surface. 
Uh, phosphates and carbonates also form um, abiotically, which means without life. Um, phosphorus bearing uh, rocks, this is a phosphatic rock right here, and they occur beneath areas in surface ocean of very high biological productivity. Now that does not mean that this is shells, right? But this is the waste products, right? A lot of phosphate is, a, is in the waste product of animals, right? In the fecal matter of animals. And we tend to take rocks like this, we grind them up, and we can use them as fertilizer. They're really important in this, in this um, capacity. Now carbonates, there's a couple different kinds of carbonates that form aragonite and calcite. We're not going to kind of spend too much time on this question of aragonite and calcite. But they do form occasionally these really neat little pebbles. And these are not shells. These are not organic. Um, these are little pebbles of, uh, of uh, calcite that form in lagoons from the water moving back and forth. And because, the, especially in warm water, we're talking about how warm water is saturated with calcite already. So as long as you're moving the water back and forth, things that are moving around the bottom tend to roll up and develop calcite shells or crusts around them. And they form these really cool little, what we call uh, ooids. Uh, and eventually you can cement them all together and form a rock called a oolite. Metal sulfides are, are all over the seafloor and they're usually associated with mid-ocean ridges. Okay. Um, they contain iron, nickel, copper, zinc, silver, uh, gold, uranium, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff in there, a lot of other metals. And they're usually associated with hydrothermal vents, right? The hydrothermal vents are powered by the heat from the magmas below the uh, mid-ocean ridges. The ocean floor is constantly pushing water down under very high pressure into the, into the rocks. And they, those tend to heat up, and then they convect right out through a black smoker. The black smoker is essentially raining out that iron sulfide and nickel sulfide and copper sulfide uh, that we might have an economic interest in mining. Another type of rock that is kind of cool or mineral is kind of cool, kind of cool are the evaporites. So this is just when you take seawater sea and you evaporate it away. What's left, right? Well, all the minerals that make water salty is what's left, right? You basically wind up uh, precipitating these uh, salts. And these usually form in restricted open ocean, uh, or we have restricted open ocean circulation. In other words, whether there's, it's difficult for the ocean to constantly bring new fresh water into an area. Uh, and as a consequence, extreme evaporation raises the salinity of the ocean. You start getting the deposition of salts. Um, the most common forms are halite, which is common table salt, which is what this uh, young uh, science investigator is looking at, and another mineral called gypsum. This, by the way, is not in the ocean. This is in Death Valley, but it's the same mineral as halite. All right, the last of the, of the group, we've kind of been going through this pretty slowly, so let's, let's try and get through this, is, is the cosmogenous marine sediments. So this is basically microscopic, or in some cases, macroscopic meteor debris. This is a little spheral that is our tectite. Um, that basically is derived from uh, taking a piece of space dust and dropping it through the atmosphere. It burns up, it turns into this little round ball, and it winds up um, at the bottom of the ocean in many cases. Sometimes, of course, it lands on the Earth, but if it was to hit you, you would hardly even feel it. It's this little tiny grain of sand. So overall, it's an insignificant proportion of marine sediments, but they're present. We can see them, and they're kind of a, a neat thing to be able to look at. All right, so we need to kind of bring up how these things exist in real world, right? In real world situations. Uh, out in the open ocean, you know, we're kind of defining it and saying, you know, there's abyssal clays here, there's uh, calcareous oozes here, there's siliceous oozes there. But in fact, it's all really a blend of these things, right? One tends to dominate over others, right? So on the continental shelf, um, we find, tend to find in lagoons. Here we see a lagoon with some land that comes up in a beach berm. We find our neuritic deposits right here, and we get our corals, and we get our sands, our beach sands, and our shelf lithogenous sediments, which tend to be coarse grained. And our turbidity currents tend to be forming here. Our abyssal clays tend to be the fine stuff that washes out, uh, not only the turbidity currents and off of the beach, but also from wind-blown dust. 
Uh, we got a lot of, um, of tektites and, and meteor, micrometeorite debris that's also falling all across the entire thing, right? So it's mixing in as well. Uh, over here near the mid-ocean ridge, we'll get a zone of uh, siliceous ooze. We might get some manganese nodules that are hydrogenous forming below the CCD, but above the CCD, we wind up getting calcareous deposits derived from the calcareous tests in warm water. Now, we won't see that in cold water. Cold water, you'll see the siliceous uh, ooze. And in fact, when we look carefully at what goes on, where we see the, the lithogenous uh, sediments deposited across the continental shelf, and then into the deep water and biogenous sediments deposited across the mid-ocean ridge, we actually find that there's mixtures of different things, right? There's no one perfect example of, um, you know, where you only get siliceous ooze uh, across an entire mountain range. You know, you, we wind up with some degree, some mixture of wind-blown dust and micrometeorite debris coming in and, and, and mixing in with the siliceous ooze. So this image right here is a really good review of everything we just talked about. So if there's one image that you want to make sure that you kind of understand why and where everything is, it would be to understand this, um, this nice little uh, diagram right here. It explains the pelagics and the neuritics. It explains their deposition. It explains their locations and the conditions under which these things form. And even the depth of the CCD and the effect it happens to have on uh, the, depo um, the deposits themselves, okay? So make sure that you take a moment to look at this. Okay, now what about the pelagic and neuritic sediment distribution? Well, neuritic sediments cover about a quarter of the seafloor, all right? Uh, pelagic sediments about three quarters of the seafloor. So when we look, here are the neuritics. These are the continental lithogenous and all that stuff is located right along the continents, right around Australia. This is Indonesia, Japan, and China, up into Russia. The Arctic Ocean is basically entirely uh, continental or lithogenous uh, sediments uh, in the neuritic zone. Uh, and you'll notice that these are in the Gulf of Mexico, all around South America. But you don't see them out in the open ocean, right? And out in the open ocean, we find abyssal clays, calcareous ooze. We find siliceous oozes from diatoms and radiolarians. And those tend to be right here in the middle, right? And we would predict those to be located in those areas. Okay. The calcareous oozes are located in the Pacific Ocean here, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Why are they located here? Well, they're located there because that's where the Mid-Ocean Ridge and the East Pacific, or the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise are located, right? There's plate tectonics, there's spreading centers that are located there. And that allows for the deposition of the different, uh, of the calcareous oozes. Uh, in the Southeast Pacific and in the Central Atlantic. All right, what about the thickness of these sediments? All things being equal, you'd think that it would be this way everywhere, and of course it's not. The thickest sediments accumulate on the continental shelves. And so here we see the biggest piles of sediment are located off the coast in the neuritic zone, especially in the Gulf of Mexico and the Bay of Bengal, uh, located here off of the coast of India, and Bangladesh is right here as well. But we also see large deposits off the west coast of Africa, off the, uh, this is the Orinoco River uh, watershed right here, and then this is the Amazon, rain, or the Amazon River right here, it started to accumulate large deposits off of its coast. This deposit right here, this deep one here, is currently being used by Brazil uh, to derive oil and natural gas from. So this is a recent oil find in the world, okay? So this is the deposit, or this is where we find the neuritic deposits. And you can almost detect, based upon the thicknesses here, what kind of rocks you're gonna expect to find, right? Here's the mid-ocean ridge, or the mid-Atlantic ridge. Here's the East Pacific rise. These are where you're gonna get your calcareous oozes, calcareous ooze through here. And then you got your neuritic deposits, your lithogenous sediments along the coastlines here and here. All right, so that leads us to energy resources, right? Because ultimately, this is what we exploit from off the seafloor that is of the greatest value. And that main thing is this petroleum. Ancient remains of microscopic organisms is essentially what petroleum is. Uh, you'll hear people say that petroleum is the remains of ancient dinosaurs. It is not. <laughs> um, that, is, that is a misnomer. Just because they're called fossil fuels does not mean that they're from dinosaurs. It just means that they're from fossil or from ancient life that existed some millions of years, but probably not in some cases as old as the dinosaurs. 
Um, more than 95% of economic value of oceanic non-living resources, right? This is a huge deal. More than 30% of the world's oil from offshore resources. So off of a platform like this is producing oil today. Future offshore exploration will be intense and the potential for oil spills is increased as a consequence. Um, so here we see an offshore rig. These things are out there basically drilling into the neuritic uh, sediments looking for any biogenous uh, oil that they can find, any petroleum that they can find. It's extremely valuable um, energy resource. It's also a very uh, valuable chemical resource. Hydrocarbons are used in plastics and fertilizers and all over the world for all kinds of different things. All right, so with that said, we've covered a lot of material. A lot of it is probably some kind of mundane stuff, but I hope the slideshow introduces you to the idea that the seafloor is dynamic. There's some really interesting and predictable things happening on the seafloor that science has figured out for us. Um, the distribution of sediments is actually quite interesting. If it wasn't for the sediments, we wouldn't have petroleum. We wouldn't have the, uh, the lifestyle that we enjoy today. Um, so with that said, this is kind of the last of the lectures, Building the Ocean. The next lecture is going to be dealing with the ocean water itself. We're going to get into the water and how the ocean is basically constructed uh, from the top down. And uh, eventually we'll get to filling it with the organisms that we all know so well, the whales, dolphins, and the microorganisms. Okay. So with that said, as always, if you have any questions, send me an email. And until next time, I hope you do great. Bye.